finalist for pilot season 2020 and I thought it was finally time to answer some of your questions. So a quick little intro to me, my name is Jenny. I've always wanted to be an actor but I never really full-time pursued it. I did my Bachelor of Fine Arts at Shanghai Theatre Academy for five years and I just moved back from Shanghai maybe last year. I was doing a bit of acting there but mostly hosting, MC, like radio DJ. So before I came back to Australia I really wanted to tick off my lifelong dream of attempting a pilot season so that's what I did in 2019. Now I uploaded a little vlog of going to the auditions, what it was like, um, it was very stressful and very like a lot of pressure because I've never really had to go for acting full time before so a lot of the time I just did not know what to do with myself I was like freaking out and to this day like even a year later I get questions weekly about pilot season about acting about how to get managers and agents and how to do auditions and I put off filming this video for the longest time because I have no idea what I'm doing I'm having like a mental breakdown like every other day because I don't know when my next audition is gonna be. I don't know when my next project is gonna be. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I'm currently not employed. I have no career path. So yeah, I just felt like if I'm struggling so much, I can't possibly give you any good advice. And why would you take advice from someone who's not even currently working or like auditioning left, right and center. But if you want the advice of a struggling actor to another hopefully not so struggling actor, then you found the right place. And I will try my best to answer your questions. But just remember, I can't go too much into detail because I don't know either. And a lot of things like you just find on Google or you just find from watching YouTube videos. Like a lot of things are as straightforward as you think they are. They just take time. You have to be very patient and you have to have very, very thick skin. So what is pilot season? Back then, a Many few years ago, it was like the booming time to go to Hollywood. Everyone would fly in from all over the world. All the actors around the country would come in because this is when a lot of networks will film the pilot episode for a possible TV show. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when you watch a lot of TV shows, including like Riverdale, Gossip Girl, the first episode usually doesn't have a name. It always says pilot. And this was probably the tester episode that they filmed during pilot season. So auditions start around early February after all the kind of festival craze and all the Oscars and the Grammys and then everyone can really like focus on pilot season. I'd say the busiest time will probably be mid-February to like the start of March and a lot of them will start filming mid-March around to April but you might get recasts around March and April so you never know you still might get auditions then and then I think during May is like when the networks look over them and either your pilot gets picked up and brought to series or it doesn't so a lot of your favorite TV shows all started out this way. But now that we have so many streaming platforms like Amazon and Netflix and Queeby, I think that's how you pronounce it, auditions are kind of all year long. So it's not really 100% necessary to come to LA for pilot season every year. And most of the people that I came here with last year, they're not coming back. It's just me, myself this time. So a lot of people in Australia are actually choosing to stay back in Australia at home this time for pilot season because self-tapes, which is when you record yourself and you send it to a local casting agent who then might pass it on to the LA cast agent are really really accessible so you can audition for LA anywhere in the world anytime and there is a myth that apparently if you're you know sending self tapes from Australia it might even make them want you more because you're international and we love a bit of something different here but don't worry, even without the visas or even if you're a tourist, uh, you can still audition or you can audition just from the comforts of your own hometown or home country. And regardless of what everyone says about people not wanting to work with you, if you're on the O1 or if you don't have a visa, etc., if they really want to, they will jump through hoops, hoops of fire to make it happen. So you never know. Managers and agents. In Australia, we have like a thing called majors where we don't really have one or the other. They just do everything. By understanding, this is just from me Googling and watching like YouTube videos. What's the difference between a manager and an agent on like Reddit or something? Manager kind of nurtures you more. They generally might have less people on their books, but when you actually get booked for a role, you either have to hire a lawyer or an agent because they can't do contract work for you. In general, they can help you pick your headshots, they can tell you what kind of career path, they can nurture you more. And for me, for someone who's more so starting out, I felt like I wanted to have a manager. Agents can also do that, just depends on what kind of agent you have, but I, I feel like agencies are much bigger and they have many more clients, so I wanted something that was more boutique and more smaller where I feel like I wouldn't drown. I have friends who have agents only, I've 
friends who have managers only but obviously like the more people who have working for you maybe the more auditions you get but that also means the more commission you have to give out so by rule of thumb the maximum they can take is 10 percent so you can work it out if you have a manager and an agent they might take 10 percent each or they might be nice and go seven seven and if you have another agent in australia you might go seven 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 for a total of 21 percent but that's all for you to negotiate and i haven't really had to do that yet so i don't have to talk money which i don't like talking about how did i find my manager is one of the questions that i get the most and it's basically what you think it is you send out a crap ton of emails you connect to everyone possible that might know someone who's in the industry so this is the way i approached it but i feel like there's a much easier and smarter way to approach it which I didn't really think about. So I went on IMDb Pro, um, that's when you can like edit your own photos and headshots and like you can own your page and claim your page and you can see like everyone else's agent. I remember the first day I found that function. I was like, oh, so this is Liam Hemsworth's manager. This is Anne Hathaway's agent. And it was like really cool. But basically a lot of them will have emails or phone numbers, etc. I ranked all the agencies and management companies in Los Angeles from zero to 200. And then I started from about like 60 upwards. Um, ranking kind of changes all the time. I wouldn't go by it so much, but I just felt like everything in the top 60 was huge and had no chance at all. So I had a little draft email, which I can kind of attach here, just explaining who I am, that I recently graduated with my Bachelor of Fine Arts and Acting, that I'm Australian Chinese, bilingual, I work as a DJ host and MC and presenter, and all the things that I've recently done, attached like a Google Drive link to my demo reel, and I also made a website. So I was watching this one random YouTube video about how to get yourself representation, and apparently like like what he made a website and it helped him and I made a website and I guess it kind of helped me as well I just went on Wix I did it in one day just slopped on all this random information and photos and resumes and stuff I guess it just makes you look like more polished and more serious about the whole business but yeah anyway so I sent those emails out slightly tailored it to different agencies and I emailed 85 agents and managers 85. So when you tell me, oh, I emailed my top favorite one, which is like in the top 10 and they didn't reply me, email some more. What else are you going to do? You know what I mean? So out of those 85 emails, I got two meetings and three emails asking me for like to send over a monologue or just more materials and stuff. Of those two meetings, I took them when I was in LA for a wedding. One was kind of like an indie film company that did a lot of horror and stuff. The office was like really dark and danky. I didn't really vibe with the guy, but he was like, yes, I'll sponsor your O1. And I was like, mm, okay had no idea who any of the people were on his books. The other one I was much more into, it was like on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. They had amazing view of everything. They had people currently on like Orange is the New Black and everything. Also, don't ask me who any of these agents or managers are because A, I've forgotten most of them and B, I feel a little weird and like talking about it just in case it comes back and bites me in the butt. Anyway, um, the guy was very Hollywood, you know, the whole when they're like, we love you, like you're gonna be working so much, like you're gonna get like a pilot this season you're gonna be crazy you're gonna be a star like Asians are trending right now and I was like mm, this feels very Hollywood and it feels like it's full of lies but anyway he was super sharp super into it super silly super Hollywood um, but at the end he was like I just don't have time to sponsor your O1 at the moment even though you're perfect and we love you and you're exactly what we want I don't want to deal with your O1 so that was that went back home and emailed some more agents and managers and some feedback I got from one of the agencies was that I needed new headshots that looked more kind of Hollywood because my previous headshots were either me five years ago or in China where they kind of airbrushed the hell out of your face. So I went back to Australia, got new headshots done and sent out a new round of emails. And we also just asked all of our family, friends and friends like if they knew anyone anyone like even if someone was interning or something just to get like feedback on the resumes on the photos etc etc so in the end went for another meeting the next time i came back which was around november which is a good time to come so go anytime from july up until thanksgiving because that's more a quieter period because then you get thanksgiving then it's christmas then it's new year's then it's the festivals then it's like oscars and grammys then it's pilot season do not think that you will find representation in pilot season they are like it's, it's a crazy time they don't even have time to breathe so november is probably a good time to go because that's when also a lot of seasons get renewed and they have new characters and there's new auditions going out so if you get signed you might even get an audition while you're there as well so when in november met up with three more management companies for some reason i only got meetings with management companies and there was one that kind of only looked after asians 
And I wasn't really sure I wanted to do that because my Australian agent did that as well. But I felt like if no one wanted to look at me, maybe an Asian's only agents would look at me. But they only looked after like Asian stars. So that didn't really make sense anyway. And then the last management company I met with, which who I am with now as well, he was a lovely British man. So like all the Hollywood like shebang aside, me being Aussie, him being British, I just felt like we were kindred souls. And he actually looked at all my credits and my demo reel because he talked about them and he asked me about my experience in China. Like you'll have a lot of management companies that just talk about themselves and don't even ask anything about you or don't even talk about any of the work you've done because I'm pretty sure like they haven't had time to look at any of it. So it's just really nice to be seen. And then at the end of the meeting, he was like, yeah, we'll sponsor your O1 when the time comes, etc." and like what do you think and then right then and there I just said yes this is fantastic this is great so and then I'm currently with them so the other approach is if you have representation in your own home country they will be more than happy to kind of link you out and set up a few meetings for you in LA because if you're working there they also get commissions so it's kind of like a win-win situation and the LA agency might get more different auditions that your Australian one can't get so I know a lot of friends whose Australian agents set up meetings for them in LA and they took over a flight and then they met with them as well and it's good because usually it's agents that are pretty reputable or management companies that they previously worked with or share clients with so they already know how to work together because if you have two agents who don't like each other or don't know how to work with each other it's also very stressful for you as the client as well so back in Australia I did ask my old Australian agent if she could help me set up some meetings she couldn't really so that's why I had to go by myself but if you do have representation in your home country you can skip all the 85 emails and just go straight to the meetings and it'll probably be a lot better auditions how do i get an audition so if you don't have representation it's you can freelance here like there's actors access la casting backstage which is kind of like our star now which you can find like commercials short films feature films a lot of them are unpaid but a lot of them are like sag after so they are paid but if you're a tourist you probably can't work on them anyway but if you just want to come here and connect and act and work like there's so many short films that you can be a part of my friend was going out for auditions like every second day just just only from the things from backstage as well but if you have representation basically um during pilot season by my understanding is when they announce all the pilots they will announce like the casting directors and who's kind of doing the casting for that show and then your agent will call them up and be like when will the script come out or when are the sides coming out when are the character breakdowns coming out and once they receive the character breakdowns then your agent will go through all the characters and see which client suits what and then they'll start submitting you for everything so <laughs> once you're submitted the casting director might be like mm, I don't really like her she doesn't look like the type and then your agent might call back and be like you know what actually like the picture she she could be she looks she can look a different way from the picture have you seen her in this have you seen her in that you should let her come in this is what happened to me for like the cw nancy drew audition last year they didn't want to sue me because i didn't look like the type of character my agent had to really push so they're always constantly working for you but i might just end there you might get submitted like i remember i got submitted for like three pages worth of stuff and i probably went to like eight auditions or ten auditions so not all of them come through and then once you go for your initial audition they might call back and follow up again, be like, how does she go? Feedback might be like her accent is not good enough or she's just not what we're looking for or, you know, like we pass it on, we're, we're going to pass on her. The next step would be a callback, which is usually the producer's test, which is when the producers will come in and look as well and you might just stop there as well. Producers don't really like you, etc. You might have multiple callbacks and then at the very end you'll have a screen test when there's probably only like five of you left and I think they like, it's like a nice studio and the filming is nice and the network execs are there but then again the network exec might have a completely different view of who they want as well and you might end there as well so it's just like a it's a really big merry-go-round and by contrary belief you actually don't get said told no you know how everyone's like it takes a hundred no's to hear one yes all i hear is no 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 all the time i don't even hear a no i would like them to tell me no most of the times you go to an audition you pick up your script you put it in the bin and you forget about it because you might never hear back, you might hear back tomorrow, you might hear back a month later. You, you generally like don't always get feedback and you don't really ever get told no. <laughs> so now it comes to like living and expenses, where to stay. So everyone recommended that I stay kind of Hollywood, West Hollywood area. Um, people said downtown or Koreatown is kind of sketchy. I actually really prefer a downtown Koreatown. I would just kind of stay away from like maybe like Little Tokyo and um, Skid Row area. but. I went to Koreatown so many times because everyone kept eating there, everyone was living around that area and it's actually quite convenient. It's probably like 15 to 20 minute drive to Hollywood. 
a lot of the auditions that I went to previously were kind of around like Wilshire, Hollywood, West Hollywood area. But then you also have like all the studios like Fox and CBS, which will be in like Studio City or Culver City area, which is a bit of a further drive out. But if you live there, just know that most of the people live like Hollywood, West Hollywood. So you keep having to do like the 40, 45 minute, one hour drive out. And last year, I only had one audition in that area anyway. So this time I did start out by staying close to Culver City. I moved because it was taking me one hour and a half to get into Hollywood because the traffic, they don't exaggerate. It is horrible. It is 24 seven and you're always gonna be stuck in it. So I moved into kind of Larchmont area and now I'm in Melrose Hill and then I'll be moving to West Hollywood afterwards. But everyone has different preferences as well. I mean, some of my friends are living in North Hollywood and they absolutely love it as well. Silver Lake, Echo Park is also like a nice hip kind of suburban -y area and Glendale, which is like a, a bit further out from Hollywood, also has like a really nice kind of like, I don't know, Fitzroy maybe vibe, like young hip, a lot of restaurants and everything. Where do you find accommodation? So if you're Australian, um, there's a group called like Australians in LA or Aussies in LA where a lot of Australians who live in LA will sublease out, short term rent out their places because they're traveling or they just know like pilot season. They can make some bank. So you can find people there. I kind of felt safer finding people there because you know, they're Aussies and if anything goes wrong, if I don't get like my money back or something, I can just blast them in the Facebook group. You can go on Craigslist, but a lot of the places ask for like one month deposit and like three month payment. And like, you don't wanna be locked into a place if you don't know what it's gonna be like. And if you don't get your deposit back, there's also a lot of like LA housing, sublet, rental, literally just search on Facebook. There's multiple groups. And a lot of people might just be subletting out a room or even a living room. Some people sublet out living rooms, it's crazy. And of course there's Airbnb, but, I have a bone to pick with Airbnb in LA. There's a lot of like occupancy taxes, city taxes, state taxes and everything. So it might be like $80 a night, but then after all the taxes, it'll round up to be like $130 a night. Especially if you're in like downtown Hollywood, the high rise apartments, there's even a crazy amount of tax onto it, which ends up being like $300 a night. So you might as well just stay in a hotel or something. So food here is also really expensive, especially if you go out to eat. I feel like no meal kind of costs under 30 USD for me here, no matter if I'm eating Asian or Western, but it might just be because I like to order like two dishes or a drink, but I want to enjoy my life, you know? So just say you're having a bowl of pasta, which would be like 17 USD, which if you think about it in Australian terms, like 17 AUD is pretty average for a bowl of pasta. You have the 10% tax, so it'd be like 1840, 1870, don't know how to do my maths. And then sometimes there'll be a service fee at the restaurant. So it might be like another dollar or two, like $20. And then I do a 20% tip. I don't know if that's too low or if that's too high. Somebody's going to be hating on me for giving a 20% tip. I know some people who are tourists who tip lower than that. And I know local friends tell me to tip more, like tip on top of the 20% tip. But your girl just don't have enough money to do that. So 20% it is. So after the 20% tip and the taxes and everything, you're kind of looking at like 21 USD for a bowl of pasta, which would be like $27 Australian, which is like a fancy ass bowl of pasta. And if you ever go for like hot pot or Korean food here, it's probably gonna be like 40 USD per person as well after tips and tax. Hello, 50 USD. So every meal is kind of expensive, but it's also a city where you have to go out and like enjoy all the food, enjoy the different bars and like atmospheres and stuff. Cause it's not fun staying at home and just like eating microwave meals or like cooking your own like pasta soup and stuff. Like you gotta de-stress as well, especially if you're here for pilot season. So on how much money to bring, I would say set aside anywhere from 18, oh, pfft, set aside anywhere from 800 to 1200 for accommodation for the month. Um, I'd say Ubers, I depending on where you live and where you're going, I probably spend like 18 to 20 USD on Uber on an average day. So that's probably like two trips. It might be lower, it might be much higher if I'm going out for the night. Um, so that's probably like another extra, just say you travel six days a week, an extra 120 USD. Food as well, depends on how many times you want to eat out a week. My usual trip to the grocery store would probably be about 50 to 80 USD and I would go one to two times a week. So just count that as an extra 80 USD on top of that. And every time you go out, let's just average it out to let's say like 30 USD per meal if you eat out. So you do the math because I can't be bothered. But I know that last year I spent a lot of money here and this year I'm still spending a lot of money here. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. It was very long, very wordy. I'm parched. Hopefully I answered some of your questions. Like I said before, it's pretty straightforward. A lot of the things you can just find on Google or YouTube, which is where I found all my information. There is no magic recipe on how to find representation or how to get audition. You're literally shooting in the 
the dark. This is kind of as much help from a struggling actor I can give to you. If you guys have any more tips, please leave them down below because I'm lost for words. That's all I have to give for you. I've given my all to you guys. What's next for me? I am here in LA for another two weeks and I'm gonna reward myself and go to New York because if I flew 16 hours all the way to the States, you best believe I'm gonna go to New York for like three days and then I go back to Australia. And then I just start my whole, I don't know what I'm doing with my life quarter life crisis thing full time again. So yay, thank you so much for watching and please subscribe for a new video next week and let me know if you would want any other acting videos as well.